Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the SACS Advanced Therapeutics Panel as part of the Pandemic Response Day here at the SACS Forum. I'm Max Herman, Head of European Healthcare Research at Stiefel Niklaus Europe, and I'm joined by fellow chair Raoul Mova, Novartis' distinguished scientist and independent pharma and biotech advisor. We have five uh, panel members here today that make up our esteemed panel. They include Daniel Witt, President and CEO of Immunic Therapeutics, Gilead Rade, COO of Red Hill Biopharma, Peter Llewellyn Davis, CEO of Apiron Biologics, Ram Selvaraju, Chairman of Relief Therapeutics, and Richard Milestone, CEO of Synergen Research. I'm sure you'll enjoy today's presentation. We've a packed event for you. And so with no further ado, I'll ask Daniel to start off by introducing us to Immunic Therapeutics and their approach to COVID. Yeah, hi, um, and thank you, Max, for the kind of introduction and happy to be here on, on the panel today. So at Immunic, um, we we have um, had good news recently. So two weeks ago, we published data from a phase two trial in, in COVID-19 patients. And if you skip forward two slides, um, so the company, um, oh, next slide, please. So the company um, is focusing on three products. I, I can just see, yeah, this slide, okay. Um, so the company is developing three programs and one of those is IMU838, which is um, which is a DH ODH inhibitor. And um, on top of um, development in our main indication, multiple sclerosis and ulcerative colitis, we also performed the COVID-19 clinical trial. And I would like to share very top line results from that trial with you. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the concept is that I'm your h 8 is active um, against a couple of different viruses, a broad spectrum antiviral uh, drug. And we know that for, for a couple of years already and, and immediately when COVID came around the corner last, last year, we, we tested that also in vitro against SARS-CoV-2 on the next slide. And quickly we were able to start a clinical trial. Um, we have here a a two-arm placebo-controlled double-blind trial with, um, on one hand, active 45 milligram IMU-828 against placebo, treated for 14 days and a follow-up period of, of another 14 days. So um, and on the next slide, you see first results from the trial. So for example, I just picked some example data from, from the trial. Clinical recovery rate was 18.5%. Uh, at day seven compared with 12.8 for placebo, um, but also some very interesting um, markers for antiviral activity. On the next slide, for example, we have seen a decrease in SARS-CoV-2 viral load in the patients at day 14 and also at the follow-up day 28. Um, and also what is clinically important is time to clinical improvement, which is a quite well broadly used endpoint now in trial. So regarding the 75% probability of clinical improvement, we had a benefit in, in, in the population of 2.9 days. If we just focus for high risk patients, it was 3.8 and for elderly patients, 4.8 days. So a quite remarkable difference um, in improvement here. On the next slide, um, some important other biomarkers um, which underline that this host cell-based mechanism is not only antiviral, but also has these um, effects on preventing overshooting immunity. So we have seen a CRP reduction very early um, after treatment start, quite substantial level here on the CRP levels on the left side, but also on the D-dimer on the right side um, of that graph. And, and maybe um, to, to finalize the, the whole picture here on the next slide, also quite good safety. So this drug really does not have shown any, any increased um, side effects in the active compared with placebo. The only thing which I marked here is the last line of this table showing that um, any TAEs of increased severity related to COVID-19 are remarkably reduced in the active arm um, compared with placebo. So all in all, quite encouraging. What I like uh, very much is that also, um, given that it's a host-based mechanism, it's likely to be quite independent of genetic variants of the virus. And um, yeah, that I think I can conclude my, my introduction. Great, next Gilead. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present uh, Red Hill Biopharma and our COVID uh, efforts. Next slide, please. Standard forward-looking statement disclaimer. Uh, just by way of background, Red Hill is uh, a specialty pharma focusing on uh, GI and infectious diseases. Uh, our commercial activity includes three approved products and sales of $90 million uh, annually. And we have a broad pipeline of uh, advanced candidates. And I'll focus today on the COVID-19 uh, programs. Next slide, please. So we, uh, we quite uniquely have two uh, promising phase two, three stage programs that are targeted at treating COVID-19. Both are small molecule, novel, orally administered compounds and both have antiviral, broad antiviral activity, which as mentioned earlier, uh, is expected to be insensitive to mutations in uh, spike protein, and as such should be uh, maintaining their activity across the dif different emerging strains and uh, variants that are developing. Opaganib, our first program, is a sphingosine kinase 2 inhibitor, and it combines both potent antiviral activity with anti-inflammatory mechanisms of action. It has gone through a phase two study in 40 patients, showed uh, good safety and uh, efficacy signals uh, in hospitalized patients. And it's currently halfway through a large 464 global study uh, in hospitalized patients in severe condition. And we hope to see read out of that uh, interesting study uh, before the end of Q2 this year. Our second uh, program, is upamostat, that is a serine protease inhibitor. It also has the, the antiviral activity combined with additional potential supportive uh, uh, mechanisms. It's uh, initiated a uh, phase two, three study in outpatients, symptomatic COVID-19 outpatients in the US. And that is of course the largest patient pool, which is currently underserved in this uh, indication. Next slide, please. A few details on, on data that we already uh, obtained for uh, Opaganib, the leading program. So it went through a phase two study in 40 patients, successfully completed it, hospitalized patients in the US. Uh, a greater proportion of the patients treated reached room air after having to be supported by oxygen by day 14 compared to the placebo patients. Uh, you see here 53% of patients managed to uh, remove oxygen support when they were treated with opaganib versus 22% of patients who received placebo. This is on top of standard of care, which uh, includes dexamethasone, steroids, other corticosteroids, and remdesivir. So the benefit is on top of standard of care. Next slide, please. Uh, beyond the promising and encouraging data from the phase two, we have uh, compassionate data use uh, previously in uh, hospitals which were published in peer-reviewed journals which support a benefit as compared to matched case controls. Uh, and we also showed preclinically a very strong uh, blocking of the viral replication in human lung bronchial tissue, uh, even stronger than remdesivir in this particular assay. So this goes to show together with the anti-inflammatory mechanisms the uh, impact that we think uh, this can have in patients. Next slide, please. Finally, based on the promising, encouraging data, we are currently, as I said, halfway through a large 464 patient study globally. Uh, we've already uh, successfully passed uh, several DSMB safety reviews and a futility analysis that was conducted after the first 135 patients. So it's all looking good uh, to, uh, towards hopefully getting top line data from this uh, important uh, study uh, by the end of Q2 this year. Next slide, thank you. Great. Uh, Peter, over to you on Apira. Yeah, thanks, Max. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so Bayern Biologics is based, as you can hear from my accent and my name, in Vienna, Austria. And uh, we've been around for a while. We were found in 2003. But we've so far developed our own cancer immunotherapy therapy products through to market, did the Tuximab better, Carceba. We received marketing approval in 2017 to treat pediatric neuroblastoma. 
and we are licensed this as well. We are not a re we are just research and development, and we are developing two strains: one COVID nineteen drug and checkpoint inhibitor in clinical development. We've got a team, and funding so far has been mostly non dilutive through deals, which was uh, which is quite useful. And we have revenues ourselves, quite rare, um, being eleven million. This is our share of royalties. We've got a small setup and global partnerships with diverse pharmaceutical companies. So rather than show you on the next slide, rather than show you the typical slide with phase one, two, three, a quick overview of our respiratory disease treatment. So we have a development of therapy to treat COVID-19 and ARDS, quite simply because in 2003, the company was founded with a SARS treatment by Joseph Pedinger, who Rao, you know personally. And we've shown in various trials with, uh, with 90 patients that the drug is well tolerated and safe in ALI, AIDS, and PAH. And now we're looking for further development in aerosol administration pulmonary indications. On the oncology side, as I just mentioned, the approved drug Carceva to treat pediatric neuroblastoma, but we also have some other interesting stuff, a first-in-class mm -hmm. autologous cell therapy to treat late-stage cancer patients using the Sybil B checkpoint inhibitor, and therefore opening up the immune system for these patients. Uh, that's on in development, but also other novel immune oncology approaches in the discovery stages. So move on, please, to the next slide. So what is our role for COVID-19? We recognize that the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, ACE2, is expressed in various human airway epithelia, uh, respiratory tracts as lung and other tissues, heart, kidneys, and arterias. So basically, ACE2 is the receptor required for the cell entry for SARS-CoV-2, and it's the main gateway which SARS uses to infect the cells. So next slide, please. Basically, it's a soluble recombinant form of the human angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it was developed by us uh, for treatment originally for ALI and AIDS. But when we started out beginning of last year, we realized that effectively it could also treat SARS. We then checked uh, with various um, organoids, human blood vessels and human kidneys that we showed that in fact SARS-CoV-2 can be inhibited by ACE2 or APN01. And doing this, showing, showing that soluble RH ACE2 blocks SARS-CoV-2. Based on this next slide, we developed the drug uh, with three major benefits. Number one, we uh, prevent infection and virus neutralization, quite simply because it prevents the entry of SARS-CoV-2 into the cell. Uh, number two, in the middle, organ protection, um, which basically it's uh, the 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 uh, APN01 shifts the RAS system towards repair and reduction of injuries to blood vessels and organs, including lungs, kidneys, and the heart, as mentioned, and therefore degrading ANG2 to ANG1 to 7. And thirdly, the control of inflammation on the right-hand side. So we, we, we reduce the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, which play an important role also in lung injury and cytokine stall. Therefore, one of the major reasons for death from COVID-19. Next slide. So the study we started in March last year, let's not forget, it was one of the first studies to actually uh, start to treat COVID-19 when the drug appeared in Europe. Uh, it's a multi-centered phase two study. It's completed recruitment in December last year, 24 clinical centers, approximately 200 patients. Treatment was for seven days in total, 29 days, including observation. And last patient, out, as I said, end of 2020. And we're expecting the, the data any day now. So we're looking forward to publishing that soon. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Frida. Over to you, Richard. Oh, sorry. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, we can jump a couple of slides. So go through that one. That's great. So we were already developing a broad spectrum antiviral. Uh, the drug is interferon beta, a protein that is vital. Uh, it, uh, it drives and coordinates our in, innate immune response uh, to viral infections. Uh, you've got on this slide here some evidence that interferon beta will uh, suppress 
uh, SARS-CoV-2 activity in vitro. So you've got, um, and also MERS-CoV uh, on, on the left there. But the, the drug itself, interferon beta, will be active against a whole range of respiratory viruses. I put these slides up here, not because uh, it's important to show that the drug will work against uh, a virus that any biologist would tell you that that's what they would expect, but to talk about the concentrations of drug that are efficacious in vitro and to attain this concentration of drug at the site of infection. Uh, and we're focused on the lungs because it's the lungs when, when they are uh, compromised by a viral infection, create a life-threatening condition. To uh, attain these concentrations in the lungs, you have to go via the inhaled route. The next slide. So we do that with a formulation of interferon beta, which is different to the injected formulations, which are used in multiple sclerosis. So we've got a pH neutral formulation, which is relatively excipient free. Some of the excipients you find in injected formulations would be active in the airways and could create an unwanted safety signal. Uh, the uh, the way we deliver it is through a nebulizer. We've tested various nebulizers and the features we look for are that it's very efficient, uh, that it doesn't damage the drug and that it's manufactured to scale. And we've got a partnership with Aerogen, an Irish company who make two to three or even 400,000 of these devices every month. Uh, we, uh, in the early part of last year, took a sidestep. We were already uh, assessing this drug in COPD patients when they had viral infections, when SARS-CoV-2 broke into the scene. And we, we sidestepped so that we could divert our clinical team and drug uh, into some COVID trials. We did two phase two trials last year, one in the hospital environment, I've got a slide coming up on that, and one in the home environment. So next slide. So we assessed the drug in patients who are admitted to hospital. These are not ventilated patients. These are patients who require uh, room air or oxygen to, uh, to function. And from here, we were tracking whether patients uh, got better, uh, which you see on the left graph. This is uh, time to recovery during the treatment period uh, with placebo and active uh, showing there. And you see a nice separation with faster recovery and we define recovery as getting to level one on the ordinal scale, which is no limitation of activities. Uh, we also saw when we used the ordinal scale, a reduction in the odds of progressing to severe disease. So that reduction in odds was 70 to 80%. And we also saw uh, moving away from the ordinal scale, an effect on symptoms, particularly breathlessness, where you get a significant reduction, accelerated reduction in breathlessness uh, in patients treated with drug. This data set uh, has led us to um, start a phase three clinical trial, uh, but it also encouraged us to look at giving the drug to people earlier in the treatment, uh, in the infection cycle, uh, a trial we loosely term the cardboard box trial, where a patient who's got a positive COVID test uh, would get the drug and the aerosol delivery system delivered to their doorstep and all trial visits, whether it's the initial consenting visit with a doctor or follow-up visits with nurses to assess symptoms and safety are conducted via Zoom calls. So the patient didn't need to leave their home and a researcher did not need to visit the patient in their home. So next slide. So that, the phase two trials that we started uh, last year uh, led to commencement of a phase three trial, uh, which is being run across uh, 20 countries uh, in Europe, uh, North America, South America, and India. That started in January. And uh, we've also uh, got a readout on the home treated patients, uh, which is coming up in Q2 this year. And we're delighted to have had our drug selected by the US government uh, for inclusion in their active two trial, which is a home based trial uh, that's progressing well. And in the meantime, we've been scaling up manufacturing uh, and working with Aerogen uh, to ensure that there's enough drug and device available uh, should we get approvals later this year. I'll leave it um, there. Okay, thank you, Richard. <clears throat> and the final uh, company is Ram telling a little bit about the Relief Therapeutics, Ram. Thank you so much for inviting me and for allowing us to be part of this panel. 
my name is Ram Salvaraju. I'm chairman of the board of Relief Therapeutics Holding Aktiv Gesellschaft. We are a Swiss-based company headquartered in Geneva, uh, dual listed on the OTCQB in America under the ticker symbol RLFTF and Swiss Six Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol RLF.SW. Uh, our lead drug candidate is known by the generic name Aviptadil, uh, the trade name uh, Zysami in the United States, and also by the code name RLF100. Aviptadil is a direct analog of vasoactive intestinal peptide, or VIP, which is an endogenously occurring substance produced by the human body. Uh, it's primarily found in the lung. About 70% of it is found bound to a particular cell type in the lung called the type 2 alveolar cell, which is primarily responsible for the production of surfactant. And it has a multimodal pleiotropic mechanism of action. We think that the three most important aspects of its biological function are as follows. Firstly, its regulation of the activity and function of the type 2 alveolar cell, particularly as this pertains to surfactant production, because without surfactant, the human lung cannot function properly and cannot effectively mediate uh, effective oxygen transfer uh, from the lung tissue to the blood. Secondly, the drug is known to function as a broad spectrum immunomodulator, not an immunosuppressant, and in particular has been characterized as an agent that uh, effectively potentiates the transition from Th1 to Th2 cytokine response. So it downmodulates pro inflammatory cytokines like TNF alpha, uh, IL 12, and interferon gamma, and upregulates anti inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, for example. So uh, we also look at uh, this drug in the context of the antiviral potential activity that it may have, particularly with respect to, via its interaction with the ACE2 receptor, the ability to actually block viral entry into mammalian cells. And this was actually confirmed by data coming out of a group uh, doing research on uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide in Brazil uh, relatively shortly after the pandemic first started. So we were originally developing this drug at relief for the treatment of various other chronic lung diseases, notably pulmonary sarcoidosis, when SARS-CoV-2 uh, made its appearance on the international scene, when the COVID-19 pan pandemic first reared its ugly head. And so in March of 2020, uh, we made the executive decision to look at the drug specifically in the context of COVID-19 infection, particularly in the context of severe and critically ill COVID-19 patients. Uh, in order to affect this in as speedy a manner as possible, we partnered with a privately held US-based company called NeuroRx, which is currently responsible for conducting clinical development and regulatory submissions for RLF 100 in the United States, and with which we signed a binding collaboration agreement in September of 2020, which effectively splits up the RLF 100 commercial pie as follows. NeuroRx has a 50% interest in profits generated by sales of the drug in the United States, Canada, and Israel. Uh, we retain an 80% uh, profit share in the rest of the world, with the exception of Europe, where our profit share rises to 85%. We are responsible for conducting clinical development and regulatory in areas outside of the NeuroRx owned territories, namely the US, Canada, and Israel. Uh, so far, we have already advanced into the clinic two formulations of RLF-100. One is an intravenous formulation, which is being used exclusively in the hospital setting. And the other is an inhaled formulation, which we hope will be applicable both in the inpatient context, again, in the hospital, as well as in the outpatient context outside the hospital. Uh, the inhaled formulation is administered via mesh nebulizer. We are also using Aerogen as the supplier for the actual inhalation device. We have so far generated phase 2B slash 3 results with the intravenous formulation only. Uh, phase 2, 3 development with the inhaled formulation is still ongoing in the United States. Uh, at the end of last month, we provided interim data from our phase 2B3 trial with the intravenous formulation, which provided uh, some flavor with respect to the fact that we appear to have multidimensional benefit around the pre-specified primary endpoint of recovery from respiratory failure with discharge from hospital and ICU without relapse 
by the day 28 time point. Uh, now, these data remain interim because in December of 2020, as the trial was ongoing, NeuroRx, after discussion with the FDA, added a 60-day time point uh, for the evaluation of patient performance, particularly with respect to not only freedom from respiratory failure, but also mortality. And this is very much in keeping with the latest regulatory guidance that the FDA has promulgated on the development of SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 therapeutics, uh, which was likewise released late uh, in February last month. So we believe that the design of this trial and the use of both a 28-day and a 60-day time point reflect accurately the current state of regulatory thinking around the most appropriate way to develop uh, COVID-19 therapeutics. And as I said, we have initial data at the 28-day time point. I'm going to share with you uh, some of those initial findings in a second, but we're also uh, still awaiting data from this same trial with respect to the 60-day time point, which we anticipate will become available within the next couple of weeks. As far as the 28-day data is concerned, I would like to highlight the following uh, key aspects. After 28 days, patients treated with our drug, RLF100, known in the US as Zysami, demonstrated a 35% higher likelihood of recovery from respiratory failure with continued survival versus patients treated with placebo. Uh, that provided a hazard ratio of 1.53, a p-value of 0 0.08. Uh, in tertiary care hospitals, that means those hospitals that are typically uh, considered- well, the one um, We may be running out of time a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'll just, I'll, finish, I'll just finish this this section here. Yeah. So, uh, so in tertiary care hospitals, we saw a 46% greater likelihood of recovery and return to home before day 28. There, the p-value was 0 0.058. And at day 28, there was also a highly significant 10-day difference in median time to recovery and hospital discharge in zysami treated patients versus placebo, where the p-value was actually 0 0.006, indicating a high degree of statistical significance. So if we see these trends continue through day 60, we believe that they have a chance to reach statistical significance across multiple parameters, and that would enable us to file for emergency use authorization. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's a great panel because addressing a, a various aspects of the COVID-19 injury and how they can be treated. I mean, this is a very relevant scenario in spite of the fact that uh, the vaccines are in development, but still keeping in mind the variants and everything. I'm very happy that uh, we have a panel addressing the various uh, needs and especially focusing on the host. And uh, hopefully in the discussion, most of, this, most of this information will come out much more clearer. Max, it's your turn. Yeah, thanks, Raul. Um, yeah, no, great, uh, interesting uh, group of therapies and it gives us a lot of hope for, uh, for the future, for actual treatments as... Uh, the vaccines are rolled out and uh, patients are still suffering uh, despite uh, um, many being protected. Uh, in terms of Peter, I know your your company, Aperon uh, Biologics, is developing specifically to the ACE2 uh, uh, um, binding element of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I wondered whether you, what your thoughts were on uh, the specific development of biological drugs against uh, COVID-19, um, particularly giving, being, bearing in mind the, the variants that we're seeing and, ha and how that's likely to impact, perhaps if you're targeting uh, the, the spike protein, which is, I believe, binds to the ACE2 receptor. Yeah, thanks, Max. Well, indeed, you know, the, the issue is quite simple. We, we're rolling out these vaccines and at the same time, particularly in Europe and in the US, you see all these people protesting about infringement of privacy. So our, our guess is that the vaccination will not, in fact, occur for everybody. People will want not, not to be vaccinated, vaccinated. And many people will say, well, look, I don't want this. I don't believe that there's a pandemic, first of all. So they will go for a treat. They will need a treatment when they get sick, most certainly. And, and there are other people who just can't take vaccines because of side effects or whatever. So really, we need really effective treatments and therapeutic agents um, and to help reduce the risk of hospitalization and, and even deaths. So vaccinations won't solve it. It's treatments that are needed. So we need a two-pronged uh, approach here. And um, the chilling point is that we won't be able to vaccinate everybody in this year. 
It's the EU has realized that Europe won't be vaccinated in 2021. And so even the way they're doing it at the moment, just picking and choosing who is being vaccinated will mean that the disease is going to hang around. It's going to be a world by reality for years to come. And, and this is going to take a while to solve. And that's why with the new variants and mutations, it's going to remain and there will be new breakouts. I don't know, in Israel, Gilead, perhaps you can address this later. From what I've read today, you know, there's going to be another lockdown. And it's the, this approach, even despite 40% haven't been vaccinated, isn't working. So it's going to be a tough one. So back to the mutations. This is basically a new problem, Max, uh, because the mutations, uh, when the virus gets transferred from one body to the next, and every person it affects, the virus changes very subtly. We don't exactly know which letter of the genetic code is being changed uh, or being swapped or deleted. And most of the time you don't realize it. But with the first of all, the British mutation or the other ones, these tiny errors in the virus changes the way the cell's molecular machinery works. So when this mutation changes, in fact, it might affect the way that the virus spreads or how infectious it might be, or how severe, severe the disease is. So the new variants of this virus, in particularly the British variant, which is shown to be more transmissible, uh, people are saying that the British variant will be the only surviving one because it's transmitted so quickly that you can't treat it in well in time. But it's because quite simply this N501Y, that occurs in a key region where the virus used to bind the cells. But on the good side, this is in favor of our treatment, it also helps bind the virus more tightly to ACE2 on the outside of the cells. Okay, so in some ways, if your drug, uh, if the virus mutates, if, if it mutates away from your drug being effective, it's also mutating away from the receptor and therefore it's losing uh, its uh, potency uh, as, a, as a virus as well. So you should yeah, be exactly. able to... Uh, that or, or your, your therapy should work against the different variants that are that bind to that receptor. I see. Yeah. Uh, and any other kind of comments from any of the other panel uh, about? Yeah. Uh, if I may, I will ask one more question to Peter. Peter, have you compared the efficiency of your recombinant is to soluble inhibitor to the antibodies, which we don't discuss today in the panel, because there are quite a few antibodies available to do the same thing. Well, we, we've compared a standard of care, yeah. which might be dexamethasone, remdesivir, yeah. which is whatever is available at the time. But we know that the, the, uh, the mutations have uh, increased the ability to bind to ACE2 on human cells, but also these variants carrying the mutation have also shown resistance to antibodies, particularly for patients who've recovered from the virus. And this is something that hasn't been checked enough. And this is where I think, you know, the next step of this disease is to look at the long-term effects, but not just though what happens to people who've recovered from the virus. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next question I would like to ask is that Danielle. Danielle, you mentioned very nicely in your talk that you are actually addressing the several host factors using the small molecules. I mean, this is very useful because, especially as the variants come and you're addressing the host factors that control no matter what type of virus it is, that's very exciting. So what do you think going forward with respect to these variants, how they should be developed further in this? Is it fast enough today? Well, I think we, this, I think this is the main reason why we're doing all that research. We need, we need therapeutics because we don't know what is happening on the mutation side of the virus? Do we see new forms emerging with more aggressive variants, more infectious variants? I we have seen both already. Um, so um, I think what we now have in mind is we need to be prepared for the next thing. And, and if we don't know how the virus looks like, we can't be pre-vaccinated, we can't develop vaccines without knowing what to what to protect for. And therefore, I think all the approaches, and we've, we've heard not only our approach with DHODH DH as, a, as a quite selective host cell based um, inhibitor, also other approaches which are targeting the host cell machinery have the benefit of um, offering a broad spectrum antiviral activity, which can be used in principle. If we now show activity as we have done, to use that in the next pandemic, even if we don't know exactly what genetic variant is, 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 is coming up. 
And I think that um, that will be a major uh, medical um, need in the in the future as well. Um, so I, I think preparedness is maybe the, the key word here. I think we need to have in mind. And I, I think this is a strength of really these small molecule approaches in the host cell. Great. Okay, Peter, it's your turn. Any other questions? Sorry, Max. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I just wondered whether there any 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 thoughts from the rest of the panel on uh, the chemical approaches, small molecule approaches to uh, the COVID variants. Are we going to find that uh, um, you know you're going to need cocktails of drugs uh, like we do with HIV rather than just a, a single treatment? I, I take uh, Daniel's comment that obviously looking at the, the the host system should avoid the need for cocktails, but more more generally with uh, antivirals like remdesivir will resistance just become a problem very quickly if we get an effective uh, well used uh, antiviral maybe i can add another aspect which would be sorry for jumping once again here i think what 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 is also worth to mention that also the just the balance between the immune response is very important as well. And that's it's also part of the host defense mechanism, which is independent of the virus trains. So, and, and that's maybe the, the, your point here that maybe makes combinations um, in the future the most most successful uh, uh, things in, in treating on the long run um, the virus we have, but also future variants of the virus. Uh, I would just like to add, you know, kind of putting on equity research analyst hat because you know we look at a number of companies that are developing small molecule antivirals as well as broader spectrum therapeutics uh, it appears to me that it is not entirely out of the realm of possibility that we could see next generation antivirals made available that are substantially more effective than remdesivir uh, we've seen some intriguing data with molnupiravir now, but I, I'm looking even further ahead towards drugs that target other aspects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a way that effectively evades resistance, you know, depending on whether you're targeting, you know, uh, the protease versus the RNA polymerase, there may actually be a way to effectively halt replication of the virus in a way that uh, allows you to address uh, not only the original strains, but also the variant strains. And again, I think if you have a cocktail approach that targets multiple aspects of the viral replication machinery simultaneously, it's very difficult to envision the possibility of a variant emerging that simply serendipitously or spontaneously achieves mutations that confer resistance to both those elements of the cocktail. So certainly that's something that should be considered with respect to the strategy that's employed uh, if you're looking purely at an antiviral, direct antiviral effect. So you are referring to the current HIV paradigm there, Ram, correct? HIV, hep C, I mean, th this is kind of a tried and tested approach to small molecule antiviral development. So I don't see why those aspects wouldn't be applicable here. Certainly, we have not historically done that with coronaviruses, but there's never been a coronavirus, arguably speaking, like this one that has caused so much havoc. So I think it's probably worth our while to explore this uh, a little bit further. Okay, great. And maybe what what just an, a further question on that is to, to maybe uh, you, you know Gilead and Daniel uh, which, whichever of you chooses to answer that are we going to get if we do combinations are we going to end up with a cumulative toxicity how, how of the what's the tox profile been of the small molecules that have been developed against uh, or are being uh, trialed against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Maybe I was too quick on my presentation. If you had a proper look on the safety table at the end, there is basically really no toxicity we see. And I, I, even I think the opposite is the case. If we combine things and there's, I think they need to be synergistically. Uh, just additive effects will not be sufficient and you will run into, into these um, drug, drug interaction challenges. If you have a synergistic approach, you really may be able to just reduce the absolute number of, of each individual drug as well. Despite we don't see any toxicities as doses we use, um, it, it really may boost the overall efficacy significantly in, in a synergistic fashion. If we find the right combination partner, we have some ideas. Um, I think the currently used um, antivirals don't look very synergistic. 
uh, with most of the approaches, maybe because also they're not the most efficacious ones. Um, but maybe next generation direct antiviral is a good combination with a host cell based approach because I, I expect quite strong synergies there. Right. Maybe moving on to the, the next question, uh, and we'll start, uh, uh, Richard, with you um, about biological treatments and, and what phases of, uh, uh, of the disease do you need to uh, trial uh, different therapies in? And I know you obviously you're developing a treatment in two different, very different settings, one in the hospital uh, and obviously one in an outpatient setting. But I know uh, there have been a lot of therapies where you, you have to get it, if you, particularly if you look at the uh, IL-6s, you have to get the in indication absolutely at, or the treatment absolutely, you know, razor sharp focused on the right patients uh, and the stage of their disease development. Yeah, I, mean, I, I very simply split the COVID treatment world into three. You've got before hospital uh, as one um, basket. And then in hospital, I think there are two. There's the pre-ventilator group um, and the, uh, the, po and the people on ventilators. And even within that ventilated group, it's not simple just to put them all in one group. Uh, so, uh, and I can see that some of the anti-inflammatory um, approaches, whether it's um, dexamethasone or, or more complex molecules, are producing some really interesting data to dampen down the infl inflammation that is, uh, you know, stirred up by the virus. So with our drug, given that it has got, it triggers multiple pathways that we've evolved to handle viruses. Um, and, and we're, it, our sort of approach is if the virus is there, if the virus is replicating, if the virus is driving symptoms, or in the home environment, if the dry virus might put someone who's at, at risk in, 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 um, in a severe um, state, then that's the rationale to administer the drug. So in the hospital setting, uh, where we've got the data, which I just ran through in the slides, uh, patients have been ill with COVID-19 symptoms for, for 10 days when we started treatment. And had you bumped into me two years ago, I'd have said that sounds a little bit late. We, we really aim to get the drug in much earlier than that. So it was a very pleasant surprise to see that they had those effects uh, when we're given the drug so late. And it's so late in terms of time, because it's been 10 days, and it's late in terms of um, severity of illness. These people are so ill, they are in hospital, and they the majority of them need oxygen. Um, having said that, we um, perhaps as an insurance policy set about giving the drug to people in the home environment, and, and we targeted these at-risk patients uh, in that setting. And that was a more difficult trial to get going, uh, but once it got going, it ran quite quickly. So we'll, we'll see whether uh, the earlier setting is uh, even better than the, the day she's going in the hospital setting. Be interesting. The only thing I'd say to that is that our drug seems to want a fire to put out. Um, so when we, we've done work in, um, in outpatient settings, in asthma and COPD, and the poorer the patient, the stronger the results is the general theme. And it might be so for COVID. It might be that um, in the home environment that the signal you know, the patients aren't poorly enough to, to generate a big signal. Uh, nevertheless, you don't need much of an effect when, when the world is broken and, and straining and hospitals are fill, filled up with patients. Any effect you can have in the home environment is priceless. So um, the, the, wor the world is very different right now. And one, one phase that you haven't uh, talked about is the, the, the long COVID, long haulers, as it were. Um, I don't know whether you've seen things, whether you're looking at uh, using your therapy in long haulers or anybody else in the panel has got any kind of uh, view on treatments to for, for long COVID. Yeah, we, we had this teasing data. We, no, long COVID wasn't a thing when we did our phase two trial where we dosed most patients in April and May last year. Uh, but the day 28 data, um, the differences between drug and placebo were greater than they were at the end of treatment on day 15. So, um, we, we, you know, that surprised us because with most viral infections, even those in hospital patients, you know, the, the groups would have converged by that time point. But you are, you know, more than twice as likely, approaching three times as likely to have recovered 
if you were on drug compared to placebo out at day 28. So we are um, sort of dusting off the protocol. We're, we're putting, we've, we've put an amendment in to look at those patients again on, on um, at the 12 month mark. And the home trial we um, finished recruiting for in January, uh, we've got a day 90 visit um, that's gonna happen there. So um, watch this space. And it is quite possible with the mechanisms that the, the drug triggers that, you know, the, uh, that um, if we can handle the virus better in the heat of the moment and accelerate the production of antibodies, let's say, then you, you might, um, you, you might uh, reduce the chance of getting long COVID. So fingers crossed, um, we'll get some good data there. Yeah. going to be a lot of long COVID uh, long haulers after uh, the pandemic. Yeah. It's frightening the, the, the number of people affected by it and, uh, People who had had no, you know, this we're learning something about this virus every day, and uh, there's no way of really predicting who's going to become a long hauler. Right, but along the same lines, um, I think uh, Gillian, uh, you must be thinking about this quite a bit too. As the vaccines are coming on board, I mean, most people we assume that will be vaccinated and in good health and all those things, but there will be a subsection that are non-vaccinated. And they will certainly go to the hospital when they first get infected by the virus. So the timing of the drugs will be very important in the sense, you know, how, of course, you certainly cannot prevent the virus infection once you are already getting into the vaccine. And as I hear the panel speak out, many of the drugs are also immune modulators in the sense in the early phase of infection, you don't want to suppress the immune system. And in the late phases of the thing, you want to suppress the immune system a little bit, the side effects don't go crazy. I, I see some situations similar to that cancer there. But what's your thoughts on about small molecules, but also on biologicals, about how do you catch the patient at the right time? Oh, it's, it's, it's a very important uh, question. And there are many considerations, of course, to take to, to address it, including the mechanism of action is, is a main one. Mm -hmm. The mode of administration, of course, is important. And then the, finally, the risk-benefit ratio in a particular disease state. Uh, so in this respect, oral small molecule antivirals specifically are amongst the most promising uh, class of drugs, I think, going forward. Uh, and there are several reasons for it. And if you look uh, back at, at how initially treatments have been uh, divided in terms of stages, uh, then generally speaking, COVID-19 therapies have been divided into two main approaches, antiviral approach aimed at stopping the virus, of course, from proliferating in the body, and an anti-inflammatory approach, uh, which is to normalize the excessive uh, and potentially harming immune response. The anti-inflammatory agents, of course, like dexamethasones, are primarily evaluated in hospitalized late-stage disease uh, because that's when the hyperimmune response uh, is evident. Uh, and affects the pulmonary cardiovascular system. You don't want to uh, target that earlier. With the antivirals, on the other hand, it's uh, although, as they said, it's, it, it's reasonable to expect that the earlier you go, the better the effect on disease progression. However, it's not yet clear what stage of disease the antivirals uh, have a, a beneficial clinical effect. And when, if at all, it may be too late already for antivirals because the uh, trigger has already created the immune response, which you can't uh, alter anymore by uh, reducing the viral load. So that's still uncertain about that. And for example, remdesivir, which is an antiviral, of course, RNA polymerase inhibitor, uh, is approved for hospitalized patients only. Uh, although its efficacy is still being questioned with equivocal outcomes and also still being evaluated in early uh, outpatients. So still a lot of questions about how to uh, target antivirals, but I would say uh, another class of, of important antivirals is the antibodies. We've unfortunately seen a string of reported failures recently with some of the anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that are targeting uh, the spike protein especially. Uh, some of them are Eli Lilly's, uh, Breeze antibodies, Veer's, GSK's. So they're still being tested in the outpatient ambulatory setting. Hopefully they'll have better success uh, there. Uh, so given all the trends and considerations, I think that oral antivirals with broad antiviral activity are amongst the most promising uh, categories. 
Uh, and the reason are the first, the antiviral mechanism of action is possibly relevant for treating most of the spectrum of disease from the early stage to the severe uh, patients. Secondly, the antivirals are uniquely and particularly applicable to the early stages uh, in mild, moderate symptoms and outpatients. And this is the vast majority of patients even going forward. Uh, and one last thing, the, uh, the broad acting antivirals as discussed uh, could potentially overcome the uh, concerning mutations and uh, be applicable to the various uh, variants that are emerging. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do on COVID-19 therapeutics, uh, and it's clearly important to target the right population with the right mechanism, the right approach, uh, in the right time. Great. Thank you, Gilead. That's a great answer and also a perfect background. Now I can ask Ram all about it in the sense that, Ram, I mean, mechanisms in vitro, we know very well, many of these things are very effective. But if you don't catch the patient at the right time and don't do the right clinical trial, all the clinical trials may want the negative answer. Part of the frustration with them is very be that too, in terms of you are giving it late to the patient where the viral load is too high and there is not much that can be done. So especially going forward with the vaccine rollout and all those things, the patient population is being less and less. Very few people actually in the hospital. I mean, still large numbers, given the fact that uh, COVID-19 affects many more people. So what are the challenges actually to do the clinical trials for all these combination drugs also, because we don't know how to do the clinical trials very well with the combination drugs. So what is the prognosis uh, you think for all these uh, small molecules, which people actually need are biologicals in a post-COVID, uh, post-vaccinated COVID world, I should say. What are the challenges there in, from your point of view? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, there's a couple of points that I want to raise, which I think are particularly pertinent here. Uh, there's a lot of ev evidence to indicate that COVID-19 is not your typical viral infection, because a lot of times the serious or critical complications of the disease are not directly caused by the viral infection itself. They're caused by the immune system's dysfunctional response to the virus. So, I don't think we can necessarily say that effective broad spectrum antivirals will just be the be all and end all to address the problem. I think we're going to have to have immunomodulatory therapies, uh, multifaceted therapies, pleiotropic therapies, which specifically address the immune system dysfunction and also address the, the specific lung damage that SARS-CoV-2 causes. Uh, which is very atypical of most coronaviruses. You do not see the broad lung damage, the, the lung tissue destruction uh, in other coronavirus infections that you see with SARS-CoV-2. Now, that being said, I think clearly the path forward that appears to be the most uh, logical will be, you know, as Gilead referred to, the deployment of broad spectrum antivirals early in the disease. And then once you've gotten past the so-called tipping point, application of other broad spectrum approaches that may not necessarily be antiviral in nature at all. For example, release drug is not an antiviral, but we believe that it has applicability both in sort of moderate intermediate stages of the disease, as well as in late stage disease in the hospital context. Now, I think it's important for us to kind of reflect on, you know, where the regulatory agencies, in particular, you know, agencies like the FDA and the European Medicines Agency are in their thinking about all of this. And if we look, for example, at the FDA's non-binding draft guidance that was issued on February 22nd of this year, uh, that really reflects the fact that the disease, the pandemic, the clinical development environment continues to change at an unprecedentedly rapid pace. So at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, many of us will remember that mechanical ventilation was considered the standard. People have subsequently figured out that mechanical ventilation kind of applied in a blanket, non-discriminating way is pretty bad for patient outcomes. And actually you should try to avoid mechanical or invasive ventilation, you know, pretty much at all costs. And so nowadays, you know, it's high flow cannulated oxygen, which is considered, you know, the standard of care in the hospital setting. And this is actually a paradigm that we saw, that we experienced, that we had to kind of adapt to as our phase 2B slash 3 trial of the intravenous formulation of RLF100 was being run. But I want to specify a particular segment of the draft guidance that the FDA promulgated that I think is especially important for us all to consider. So 
you know, the FDA, you know, made a lot of general comments around, you know, how uh, challenging it is to conduct clinical trials in COVID-19, uh, how the patient population continues to evolve, how the standard of care continues to evolve, how lots of drugs are being applied kind of, you know, off label in an ad hoc manner. And so there isn't a real definitive standard of care that's emerged, you know, using remdesivir and dexamethasone is now kind of widely accepted to be the closest you probably are going to get at this juncture to standard of care in the United States. Nobody really thinks of hydroxychloroquine as an appropriate standard of care, even though you can find it being relatively widely used. But I think the most interesting aspect of the FDA's draft guidance pertains specifically to the efficacy endpoints. And they actually uh, made reference to uh, five efficacy endpoints that I think... Ram, we only have two minutes left. So we, uh, I just want to, so what I hear from you is there's a lot of flexibility given the evolving situation on the, from the side of the FDA to be flexible in giving a mandate to drug development. As well, I, yeah, I think you have yeah. to make sure that you focus on mortality, freedom okay. from respiratory failure, and time okay. in the hospital. That's what I was going to say. Those okay. are the three that I think the FDA okay. relates this importance on. Great. That's a great uh, feedback from you, I mean, in this challenging way. So if I understand, I mean, from the panel, there is actually, we all agree that the great unmet medical need for new molecules in spite of the successful vaccine development. And uh, there are going to be combinations. And you are saying the clinical trials are possible because FDA is very uh, supportive in, the, in this development. And as I also see some similarities between COVID and the cancer vaccines in the sense that you have to play with the immune system in such a way that from early phase to the late phase in terms of down regulating the, uh, the dreadful responses in the long term, as Richard has mentioned. So any other comments from the panel as we are, we are yeah. still one and a half minutes. I have one comment. I think yeah. it's absolutely maybe the most important point here. Um, we need to better understanding how the immune system is, is functioning in these patients. And we need to come away from the simple thinking that immunosuppressive is causing more virus infections. We need to, to, to modulate the immune system in the right fashion. And uh, for example, to differentiate between effector cells um, resting cells. So, and for example, the metabolic targeting as we do is some, some way to really balance the right um, response on, on on the immune system to make sure we don't um, uh, we don't increase risk of virus reactivation while suppressing the immune system and we do it selectively and, and um, that's maybe the most important point. Thank you, Daniel. Max, any comment? I think there's a there's a role for maybe diagnostics as well to understand that on the immune system side why certain patients go into this uh, inflammatory phase and others don't and it's a it's a harmless virus for, for many people but others it's absolutely uh, a tragic a tragedy so it would be interesting on the diagnostic side a, a topic for another another panel i would say hey thank you very much to the thanks to the panel for this wonderful discussion we still have 10 seconds and i want to thank the sacks and all the members that made this uh, lively session possible and uh, we have no technical uh, failures, thanks to the technical team, and thanks to Saxon, the whole team that put this together for us. Thank you for all the Thank you. Thank you. See you, see you next you. time. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Bye-bye.